Greetings, everybody. GleeCon here again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. We are now getting ready to play the second game, Warcraft 2, Tides of Darkness. Um, not counting its expansion, we'll play that later, although we are going to play, as you can see here, the Battle.net edition, because that is uh, the definitive, more up-to-date version that has... There's not really a lot of game changes, but it does include the expansion. Stay a while and listen to this one. We've got this picture of, looks like a griffin. Maybe that's a wild hammered dwarf, although that's a little, little bit of a weird one. And he's throwing probably an orc off of a ship. Cool. Okay, we're not going to obviously read like all of these things. The original game came out in the 93, 94, 95 year era. Look at this. Uh, no, that's just a software program. Um, but yes, the actual game, I think, came out around 1999, the, the expansion. So if you want to consider this, we're about 97, I think. Um, so still some time ago. And then we we get up to about 1999 with the Beyond the Dark Portal. Okay, we're going to skip this. Although um, it's pretty important to know before you call on the telephone for technical support or... Um, if you don't have uh, at least your CD-ROM up um, and you're using at least Windows 95, <laughs> then you're going to have a bad time. I'm going to skip the tutorial because we'll just, uh, that's all things that we're familiar with from the last game. And, and I've this game I played a lot of. Uh, this is, other than World of Warcraft, I would say this is the game I spent the most amount of time with, but mostly as a youth. Like I said, I don't know that I've... I've beaten the game for sure using the cheat codes. Um, but I don't know that I've actually plowed all the way through and beaten everything. I don't... I I think I played the expansion some. I really don't know that I've actually played very much of Beyond the Dark Portal at all. I usually get myself pretty deep into the game and then get frustrated and move on or something. I don't know. I've never had the commitment to stay, but this time that's going to change. Um, like, if, if nothing else, we'll just do like we did on the last game and... We'll slow the game speed down and we'll save scum the heck out of things. Um, I do notice, so there are some things that are noteworthy. One, your people have levels now. That's cool. Two, you can actually see their hit points. You don't have to guess at it. Love it. Three, they have armor values. Four, you can tell their damage range and therefore you can see what the upgrades are doing. Um, you can see if they're ranged attack or not. You also can see their sight squares and their speed, so there, there's some cool things to do. Um, they can still move, attack, but now you have the patrol option, which is pretty cool. So you could set a, a point from where they are and they would just automatically walk back and forth. Pretty neat. I don't think I've actually used that very much. Stand ground is great because you can make your footmen say, stand ground in front of your attackers and they won't go run up and attack the archers, which was an annoying thing. Um, you can make them attack the ground, so they'll just always hit a specified spot. Say you thought an invisible thing was there. Um, or you wanted your catapults to hit a certain spot that you knew the guys were about to go into. So those are some pretty, just nice quality of life improvements. You can now auto-command by right-clicking. You can group up to nine units. Just beautiful, beautiful things. There's ships, um, transports. You can play multiplayer, that will not affect the common to us, but I did play a decent amount of multiplayer with my buddies back when I was younger. Um, I don't know that we, we might have played Direct Connect back then. We might have drug our computers over to each other's houses for all I know. Um, but we played on Battle.net too, so. Okay, so I'm going to kind of skip this because we're not going to play with that. It's not important to our lore and I'm not really interested in doing any map editing or anything like that for the scope of this show. I don't have a drive to do it. I have no interest. Um, and there's no, there's, it would not benefit anything that we do on this channel. Um, this is a pretty, I mean, even though this is in the nineties, this is some like, I feel like this is like retro. This met, Oh, this is look, Chris Metzen. That's one of the things we recognize that name from. So not only is he a writer that was obviously pivotal in creating a lot of lore, dude was drawing. So you know what? Let's pump the brakes. I was going to roast on his drawing a little bit here, but considering all of the hats he wears, he's, that's better than I can draw. So that's pretty cool. 
I don't know if that's him drawing that or not. I can't tell. It doesn't look so. All right, so we are going to read about these a little bit here. Or at least we're, maybe we'll, yeah, sure. All right, so we have the Legends of the Land. We have the Balding Lothar that I mentioned. His his beard's pretty big. I don't know how you get a gap like that in your mustache. Mine, mine, I don't think I could ever do that. And then you look at his image here. He's got the gray hair. Sir Anduin Lothar, he was sired and raised in the kingdom of Azeroth. Um, he's 57 years, yeah, I'm just going to skim it. He's 57 years old. Um, he was given a position within the king's honor guard at an early age, became age, became a knight, armsman to the Brotherhood of the Horse, which is our knights that we will use. And actually, we had knights in the last game as well. He sought out the Tome of Divinity. We did that in the first game where he went to Northshire Abbey, almost killed him. He had to be rescued. But when he came back, he led the armies against the Horde. Uh, but they ultimately ravaged the kingdom of Azeroth, which becomes that gets retconned to become the kingdom of Stormwind. Um, his buddy King Lane was killed, but he rallied everybody and helped led the retreat across the sea. They, because of all his service, he's been named Regent Lord of Azeroth, and he controls all land and air forces in the Alliance. Um, notice that we're not saying sea. He has this, uh, ven this vengeance quest to kill. Gul'dan is a central figure from the Horde side. He's the warlock of the inner circle. I'm guessing that becomes replaced by the Shadow Council. And they're here, they're calling him the Destroyer of Dreams. Those titles, I don't know if they last the test of time. Um, the demon killed Jaden, did train him, that stays. He is perhaps the most powerful warlock ever. Okay, that's pretty accurate. Um, he's obsessed with finding the tomb of Sargeras. That's a big part of this game um, because he hopes that Sargeras, the demon lord, um, he can get his power. He has created Necrolites, the Ogre Magi. Okay, that's retconned. He did not create the Ogre Magi. Um, but I think in this game, he does help them use the elven runestone so in a way he does kind of help recreate them and he definitely is a big part of creation of death knights um and all kinds of evil stuff that we've read in, in chronicles he wants to become omnipotent all right now this guy is new uther lightbringer he was mentioned in the arthas book that we read uh, when we read chapter one in that book so he's someone that's from loran it says he is an apprentice to arch Archbishop Alonsus Fowl in our book that we read, that is the leader of the kind of the, the holy order. So they'd be like the Vatican sort of. He's like the Pope. So this is his apprentice. Um, he's also a big part of World of Warcraft lore. I'm pretty sure that in Shadowlands you'll deal with him. Um, in the first war, he learned that you can't just be a priest to win because they obviously lost. So the Archbishop has devoted to rebuilding the order to make their church stronger. And Uther says they have to not just be able to be priests, they've got to be able to defend them. So he starts this order. It sounds like he's a big part of starting the Paladin order, which we'll get to in whatever are soon to be episodes of Chronicles. So they be, they form the Knights of the Silver Hand, and he, he meshes that, the knighthood with the priesthood, and that's why there's no priests in this game. There are just paladins. Cho'Gall is the number two behind um, Gul'dan. It says that he's the fifth circle. So at this point, we're, we're delineating different circles within the Shadow Council. I think they do away with that. He is all throughout all of the lures, chieftains of the Twilight's Hammer Clan. Um, he's an ogre magi with two heads. And... He wants to master the energies of the Twisting Nether. That's separate from Gul'dan's mission. But he does just want to kill all peoples. Zul'jin finally gets inter inter uh, entered the fray in this one. He is the troll leader. Um, he fights the elves a lot. And they love Zul'jin. And I think he does actually stick around as a leader of the trolls deep into World of Warcraft, if not even almost to the present. Um, initially, they asked him to join. 
he we know he's going to get captured and he has to be rescued and then they will be joining us that's the next chapter in our book there are still demons um Gul'dan has entered a pact with the with the demons so it's possible the horde can wield them i don't know if we fight neutral demons we may it's possible like at the end game uh, I think they were a little bit OP, so they they cut that out a little bit. And the undead, um, I think the Death Knights now can raise these up. I don't know that other races, like I don't think the Alliance messes with that in this one. Okay, there's still gold mines, lumber, and now there are oil patches. You've got your peasants and your peons still working it in, at, at sea. You have different things. There's the runestone at Caradero. We'll deal with that. Um... It says it is seized by Gul'dan and his ogres, and they create the Altar of Storms. No, and the elves know that that's what has been used to create the Ogre Magi in their land, and they want to destroy any of them. I don't know if we do some of that during this mission. The Tomb of Sargeras is going to be risen from the ocean. He learned from, uh, the Sorcerer Medivh, Sion and son of Egwin, promised to divulge it to Gul'dan, but Gul'dan actually kind of learned it magically and it put him into a coma but anyway the whole point of the secret goal of the orc campaign is for this to happen and when the very end of it comes and we split and you have orgrim doomhammer having to do a double take because it he gets abandoned by a big chunk of his forces while they raise this up and, and that creates ca catastrophe and then there's the dark portal at this point just called called the portal eventually that will become our dark portal that is uh, the goal of the humans is to s destroy this and close it down um, as, as best as they can. We get a nice map. This is pretty accurate for the most part, even to this day. You have the Kingdom of Stormwar Stormwind. I don't know what Balor is and if that stays. And the Tomb of Sargeras is right there. Look how close it is to Stormwind. This is the Great Sea and actually the Great Sea. Over, at this point in time, there's no vision, I don't think, for Kalim, Kalimdor yet. They were talking about crossing the Great Sea. Um, but yeah, there's a whole other continent that, that they never talk about. The Dark Portal is over here in the Blasted Lands, Northshire. You have Black Rock Spire. That's the, the seat of the Orcs. So we have these two capitals. Now, they drove north into Kazmodan. I guess that's this entire region. They have the orcs bottled in Iron Forge and the gnomes bottled up in um, Nomergon. They Grim Metal will become a battleground, I think, and Dun Al Gaz. I think those are battlegrounds. They are talked about somewhat. They still exist. All of these things exist. They're going to go by land and by sea. Um, this is the nation of Kul Tiras. This is roughly more or less. This is where it's still located, Kul Tiras. Um, that's where the navy is going to come. So the orcs go to Zul'dair first. That's what we'll do in our next episode. This is them just getting ready. Like, hey, we'll come just start testing out our nation here um, by taking this island region. And they will then go forward and land in South Shore, Hillsbrad. These regions are where the battles will come. Um, there will be battles in Tolbrad, Crestfall, uh, Tolbrad, I think, is a uh, um, PvP zone now uh, when, I can't remember which expansion, maybe Cataclysm. Crestfall is a, one of the final battles um, in the human campaign. You have Dune Motor, Stromguard, all of these things are canon, and they still exist pretty much right where they are right now. Gilneas, Dalaran, no, except Dalaran we know gets moved up, ripped out of the ground and moved to Northrend. Lordaeron, this becomes... The Undercity, this becomes the land of the Forsaken eventually in Warcraft 3-ish. Alterac, Caradero, Stratholm, Tears Hand. Uh, I don't, these I think, I'm wondering why they're listed there. Because I don't think we go and fight there. Maybe, maybe there, maybe there's some fights there. There's Quel'Thalas where the elves are. So we're starting to involve the other races. So pretty neat. Okay, there's another picture by old Mr. Metzen. He's got an orc slicing the throat of a human, and we're going to read a brief history of the fall of Azeroth as told by the Matriarch of Trisful. This is why this episode is going to be long, because we've got, just like we did in the first manual, we've got to talk about the history leading up to now from both human and orc perspective. Here we go. 
My name is Aegwyn, and for over 1,000 years I have wandered the realms of this world and endeavored to safeguard the peoples of his lands against the ethereal powers of the great dark beyond. Okay? I have seen mighty kingdoms rise and fall. I have witnessed the deeds of high nobility and the lowliest of rabble both conspire to define the destiny of mankind. It has been only recently that I have regrettably become directly involved in the matters of men. For countless ages, it had been the charge of my order to shelter and protect mortal man from the mysteries of the great dark. Yeah, that's sort of true. It's really more against the burning crusade and the palpable heinous evils of the realms beyond. To battle these dark forces of the twisting nether, we were given considerable power and longevity rivaling that of even the ancient elves. Within this power came one grave burden. The guardian must not interfere with the affairs of men until the time comes when a successor must be chosen and the mantle of guardianship is passed to another. Thus did I, Aegwin, last guardian of the Order of Trisful, judge that my time had come. So I wonder if... This is where, obviously, the genesis of this idea of the guardian and all these things are coming into place. But there's definitely a lot that still needs to be worked out. The Great Dark, what is that? You know, what does that become? The Twisting Nether as opposed to the Void. Um, and they're calling, she's calling herself the Last Guardian. Forty-two winters have passed since I first came to the kingdom of Azeroth in search of the conjurer Nielus Aran. It was he whom I had chosen to sire the heir of my powers. Nielus was exceptionally talented in the simple conjurative magics of men, and I believed that he would be the perfect mortal father for my child, and so he was. I gave birth to a son and named him Mediv, or Keeper of Secrets in the ancient tongue of the elves, in the fall of the year 559, so we still have the old dating system. I transferred all of my knowledge and power into the infant, locking it deeply within him to manifest itself only when he reached physical maturity. Believing that my work on this world was done and seeing that my son would be cared for by Nihilus' people, I wandered across the fields of time, preparing myself for the passing. I kept a distant, watchful eye on my son for much of his young life. I was assured that the deep-seated altruism of Trisful would guide him in his trials and temper his heart and mind as to make him worthy of the guardianship that was, I believed, his destiny. And that benevolence of Trisful, that definitely got, got shook up. On the eve of the marking of his 13th birthday, the power lock deep inside of my son awakened, unable to deal with the raw cause. Now we've gone from 12 to 13, so we've upped that a little bit. Because 14 is, I think, where they eventually land on that. Unable to deal with the raw cosmic energy surging inside him, Medivh suffered a massive psychic, massive psychic trauma. He was pacified by the good clerics of the Northshire, they removed the youth to their sacred abbey and for six years tended to his all but comatose body. And that, I think, seems a little bit more right with the timeline. Eventually, Medivh awakened from his sleep seemingly in full control of his faculties and powers, yet underneath the confident and almost arrogant facade, I somehow knew that my son had become malevolent and corrupt. The wisdom and power that was his birthright had been perverted by distant forces within the twisting nether, altering the human part of his soul and marking him with its evil touch forever. So that concept of corruption came through. Um, it hasn't been tied to, to Sargeras yet. It was not until the first wave of those wretched creatures known as the orcs thundered through the dark rift that I realized how incredibly dangerous my son had become. With his mastery over the arcane energies increasing almost by the moment, Medivh had set out to probe the extent of his ability to manipulate the world around him. Delving into the forbidden arts of necromancy, Medivh began to unravel the mysteries of life and death. He took to consorting with demons from the lower planes, using their powers to augment his own. His hunger for power became stronger, and with every minor success, Medivh fell ever deeper into the dark abyss of madness. He traveled far throughout the astral plane, exploring the infinite secrets of the great dark beyond. It was then in the midst of swirling, chaotic hallucinations that Medivh first encountered a world beyond his own, and captured a glimpse of the aberrant, murderous denizens of that place. Here at last was the tool that Medivh had been searching for. Obviously, they've massaged that quite a bit. Desirous of complete dominion over Azeroth, Medivh used the insights gained from the knowledge of Trisful to strike a bargain with Gul'dan the Warlock, the mightiest of the rulers on the dark red world that haunted Medivh's visions. Communicating through deep trances and astral projection, Medivh told Gul'dan of an ancient tomb lost beneath the North Sea that contained power beyond imagination. 
It was to this tomb that I had banished the ancient demon lord Sargeras after a long and exhausting battle 800 years before. Even I cannot say whether or not the power of Sargeras remains entombed there. The promise of incredible power tapped from a true monarch of the underworld was enough to make the insatiable Gul'dan agree to do Medivh's bidding. Medivh agreed to fur furnish the location of the tomb of Sargeras to Gul'dan, as well as an entire world to conquer. In exchange for this gift, Medivh required the total destruction of the only force he believed capable of contending his ascendancy to power, the great kingdom of Azeroth. Thus, in the year 583, the first of Medivh's unnatural portals was opened between the world of Azeroth and the red world of the orcs. Although the time of my passing had drawn near, I traveled to Medivh's mystic tower to reason with him and attempt to dissuade him from a path that would surely lead to his own destruction. The power that was once of Trisful had become so twisted inside him that my pleas seemed as nothing. I fought with, that, with what energy remained in my weakened body, having given all of my powers to him so long ago, I was easily defeated and banished from his sight. So you can see in The Last Guardian that a lot of this is where the writer of that book um, has drawn from these snippets to make his novel. So that's cool. The arrival of Gul'dan and the Horde Warchief Blackhand heralded a war that tore the realm of Azeroth asunder for nearly five years. The once rich lands of the kingdom were raised and left fallow by the merciless orc armies. Yet, And yet for all his craft and guile, Medivh did not survive to see his plans come to fruition. My son was killed by a bold Azerothian raiding party who broke into his tower and slew him in the very room where he first made contact with the minions of the Horde. Even the great warchief Blackhand was eventually destroyed as his ultimate victory drew near, betrayed by his servant, Orgrim Doomhammer. The greatest loss to the peoples of Azeroth came when King Lane, their benevolent and just ruler, was killed at Storwind Keep fell under siege and was overthrown by the Orcish Hordes. Only the valiant leadership of Anduin Lothar, Knight Errant in the Brotherhood of the Horde, Horse, and, and a hero in the war allowed the survivors of Azeroth to escape from their decimated homeland with their lives. So I don't know that the assassination is part of the canon yet. Even with Medivh and his vile magics gone, the portal continued to channel hundreds of orcs into the human lands every day. With the death of Blackhand, Orgrim was quick to seize control over the Blackrock clan, the most powerful orcish force on Azeroth. While others still vie for supremacy over the rest of the scattered orc clans, Gul'dan, the infamous warlock and chieftain of the Stormraver clan, is rumored to be amassing a great navy to find the legendary tomb of Sargeras for himself. Rend and Mame, the barbarous sons of Blackhand, also have secured a strong following amongst the orcs and hope to wrest ultimate control of the Horde away from the treacherous Doomhammer. Although other factions grow stronger within the chaotic Horde, it seems certain that all of the clans will follow Doomhammer's plans to hunt down and destroy the renegade humans of Azeroth wherever they choose to run. And that's Lothar leading the exodus from Azeroth. And you could argue the babies he's carrying are well, the same wise. That this is maybe Varian. Okay. The Alliance of Lordaeron. <clears throat> With the arrival of the Azerothian refugees upon the shores of Lordaeron, King Terranus formed a council of delegates from each of the seven kingdoms under his rule. Recounting terrible tales of destruction and carnage wrought by the Orcish invaders in Azeroth, the steward lord Anduin Lothar convinced the sovereign of Lordaeron to, un to unite, unite themselves against this great threat. Despite much quarreling and debate, the lords acquiesced to Lothar and Terranus and agreed to unite their armies under the general command of Lothar himself. As the shores of Lordaeron had already been savaged by small bands of orc marauders, Lothar found a strong ally in his longtime friend, Admiral Dalin Proudmoor of the seaside kingdom of Kul Tiras. Thoris Trollbane, Lord of Stromgard, was also quick to offer his support to this newly forged alliance, sensing that the time for glorious battle was at hand. These warriors were not the only ones to get ready for battle. As the Holy Writ commandeth that the whole armor of righteousness be worn in the war against evil, Alonsus Fowl, abbot of the now-destroyed North Shurabi, convinced the ecclesiastic ministers of Lordaeron to gird their priests and followers alike with weapons of war. As the Guardians took up swords of light to defend the heavens, so must the holy men of Earth be prepared to combat the dark tide that was quickly approaching from the south. From the ancient subterranean halls of Cosmodan came the stoic dwarves of Ironforge, reporting that the orcs had already begun to assault their mountain kingdom. The dwarves offered their support in arms and ingenious technologies to the Alliance, who in turn assured them that the orcs would be driven back at all costs. 
the reclusive elves of Silvermoon ventured forth from the shadowy forests of Quelphalos to offer their services to the Alliance. Their magic, so closely tied to the forces of the Earth, had shown evidence that the orcs had been defiling the very lands of Lordaeron as part of their sinister plans. The ill-bred prejudice had, that had existed for eons amongst the three races was put aside, and a bond was formed between these ancient neighbors. This bond would become a force known across the whole of Lordaeron as the Alliance. Thus united in arms against a common foe, the Alliance stands upon the shores of destiny and awaits the coming of the tides of darkness. Nations of the Alliance. So we'll just go through these quickly. I'm not going to read them all. Although that would be cool. I think it would make, if we read everything like that, we'll, this video would be like two hours long. Um, so the leader of Azeroth, which aka Stormwind, is blue, run by Lothar. Lord Aron will be white as we play, and that's King Terranus. Um, also, they're really big in this game, um, almost as important as Blue, as uh, Storm, Stormwind. Stromgard is red, led by Trollbane. Um, they will be important in the battles against Cosmodon. Kul Tiris will be green. They will be the naval fleet, um, led by Dalen Proudmoore. Jaina's uh, mother. Gilnius will be black, led by Gen Greymane. They will fight them, but they're going to be a small part because they don't really want to get involved. Dalaran will be purple, violet, and they lead the Kirin Tor. They're mostly a wizards. And finally, Lord Paranol, the weakest, orange. They are also the ones that will be the ones to become traitors. Okay, I'm, and we'll play these with the games. We'll have peasants, footmen, and we'll get from this game is where it starts the cool trend of getting uh, them saying some cool things. Elven archers will join us along with rangers once you upgrade them. I love this picture. I have uh, drawn it myself, like looking at it and copied it. Like this strategy, this manual was a huge part of my childhood. I probably read it a billion times. There are the knights, okay, not a billion, that's mathematically unlikely, but hundreds, I would not be shocked. And then you get the cool paladins led by Uther. Um, they will get ballista as opposed to catapults this time. So we will still get mages. Um, I don't know how you use them as much. But you get the dwarven demolition squads. Those are neat. Uh, you do get some air units. The Gnomish Flying Machines are your scouts. The Griffin Riders are the Wild Hammer Clan of the Dwarves. Huh, it says they've allied with Elves. Interesting, they use Storm Hammers. You'll get Oil Tankers, those are your Grunts. Elven Destroyers, so the Elves help you with great having fleets. Um, your Transport Ships. The battleships, they just come from the Alliance themselves. And then gnomes help you with submarines. Uh, so the spells that paladins can have are the Holy Vision to clear that fog of war. Healing, OP. Exorcism, so that's a, a magic that destroys undead. Interesting. I don't remember ever having to use that very much. Mages cast lightning, I think that's their main spell. Fireball is a bigger one that does AoE. Flame Shield, I think that you put it on your people and then anybody that comes near them takes damage. Slow is, I think, pretty OP because you can make them go slow, like, like allow them to be hit by your catapults and stuff. And the ever terrifying invisibility. <laughs> Blizzard is a big AoE spell. And then Polymorph is just OP because you get a bunch of wizards and you could just Polymorph, turn you turn them into sheep. So, But th this is... If you look, the, a lot of these spells are canon. Um, Holy Vision, uh, Exorcism, that is more like light magic. But look at this. Lightning Bolt. Um, well, okay, that becomes a shaman thing. But Fireball, Flame Shield, Slow, I don't think so. Invisibility, Lizard, or Ice Storm, Polymorph. These are staples of Alliance, of, ma of mage, Arcane Magic. You can build town halls, farms, barracks, lumber mills, just like before. Blacksmith. Now there's towers. These are huge. Getting guard and cannon towers. Huge part of the defense in the game. 
shipyards to build ships and foundries are like the blacksmith of the sea oil refineries you can upgrade your um town hall to a keep you get your stables your churches that's all still the same but now you can also have no mission vendors mage towers that's from before aviaries for the griffins and your keeps can be upgraded even further to a castle so that ability to upgrade your town hall is cool i used to love these charts that tell you what you can how you get each what do you need to build the different things um because that was also just something you had to kind of learn in the last game all right flip it over let's look at the orcs the history of orcish ascension as told by gul'dan chieftain of the stormweaver clan all right the rise of the shadow council oh there we go it's like an elemental force of havoc and destruction, we thundered through the lands of the Draenei, devastating all that we beheld. Oh, and that's their first mention of the Draenei. Not one life was spared. No building was left standing. The only traces of their existence were the blood-soaked fields they had worked for nearly 5,000 years. Uh, I don't know if that's true. And the rank, acrid smell of the huge victory fires that consumed the bodies of their young. Ooh. The Draenei were a weak people, hardly worth the effort of our raiding sweep. That's not true. In the end, however, even these simple victories serve to keep the inferior in their place. It has always been so with my kind. The savage, brutal tendencies of the masses are easily manipulated by those who hold true power. Power is the true force that drives the great destructive machine that is the Horde. Those who imagine themselves in possession of this power rally around their clan banners of violence. Yet without a common foe, even the leaders of the Orc clans blindly turn upon each other. The appetite for destruction that prevails amongst these fools drives the Horde might and might alone is honored above all things i am gul'dan the greatest of all warlocks and initiate of the seventh circle of the shadow council no one knows the dark burning allure of ultimate power better than i in what past is my youth i studied orc magics to the tribal shaman of my clan okay that's true my natural talent for channeling the cold negative energies of the twisting nether brought me notable standing amongst the other shaman and i knew that even nerjul the greatest of my teachers became jealous of me as my abilities grew ever stronger so there's that name, how it gets introduced in the lore. My aspirations rose higher than those of my peers and masters alike, for I knew that the scope of their vision was limited by their devotion to the advancement of the Horde. I cared nothing for the Horde or its petty politics. I cared nothing for this world over which we had complete dominion. I cared only for the chance to fathom the spiraling mysteries of the great dark beyond. I had begun secret explorations of energies far beyond the scope of anything that my so-called tutors could possibly comprehend. It was at this time that I discovered a being of immense power, the demon killed Jaden. I was in awe of his heartless fury. To witness his awesome power was to be all but consumed. In the fleeting fevered nightmares he brought me, I touched the essence of that which lies beyond. Within me an unfathomable lust was sown, a desire to wield the fury of ethereal storms and to stand unscathed within the dying hearts of burning suns. And this rise of the horde, it would seem, draws a lot from this too. Under the tutelage of Kill Jaden, I realized how limited even my understanding had been. Untold histories of ancient demon races and primal magical dimensions were made known to me. I learned that there existed worlds without number, scattered throughout the darkness beyond the sky, worlds to which I might lead the Horde as only one of my abilities could. Though I remained with my people on the dark red world of the Draenei, I soon learned to project myself into the depths of the twisting nether, being driven nearly mad by the whispering chaos contained therein. Although it seemed it would mean my death, I was irresistibly compelled to continue my sojourn until, finally unbound from my corporeal existence, I understood the whispers. It was then that I first spoke to the dead. Look at Gul'dan the Warlock. Ancestral worship has long been at the heart of Orcish religion. There's that. While nearly all of the Orcish hordes believed that our dead elders watched and guided us from the depths of some lost realm of chaos, I believe this notion to be a product of ritual and not reality. Within the twisting nether, I discovered that, there's, that the spirits of the dead do linger on, floating on the astral winds between the worlds. I learned that they kept their endless silent vigil over the clans in hope of finding some means of escape from their lifeless torment. I knew then that these spirits of the dead would be a useful tool for anyone who could bind them to his will. And that ties into how he gets the Death Knights to resurrect. Years passed. My apprenticeship under Kill Jaden had allowed me to become the most powerful warlock the clans had seen in many generations. My place within in the Horde was as a respected leader, but as ever, tensions ran high amongst the clans. The destruction of the Draenei left nothing upon which the great beast of war could feed. 
After centuries of violence and warfare, we had finally conquered the whole of our world. With no enemies left to crush and no new lands to conquer, the clans had fallen into a state of utter anarchy. Minor disputes between clans led to open battle and massive bloodshed. Those chieftains who attempted to assume the position of overlord soon found themselves slaughtered by the ravenous legions of the disheartened horde. I knew that the time had come to claim the mantle of power that I had so long neglected. Yeah, so that's that's been changed. I quickly gathered together the few warlocks who had shown some spark of passion and desire to rise above the petty quarreling of the clans. To these warlocks I bestowed the knowledge of the dead by leading them in secret rituals and communing with the spirits of the Twisting Nether. Those who were incapable of channeling this power were destroyed. After a time, a pact was forged between the members of our circle and the dark spirits whose energies we had learned to invoke. I would use my place among the warlocks to shape the thoughts of others. While cloaked by a veil of secrecy, they would be immune to the caprices caprices of the bloodthirsty masses. Thus did the Shadow Council come to be. Within a few short months, the Shadow Council had its hand in all of the important political matters within the Horde. Nothing occurred within the Horde that we did not know about, and many events took place by our design, so cleverly implemented that even the clan chieftains were oblivious to our manipulations. Before half a year had passed, we had assumed near total control of the inner workings of the Horde, yet behind all of our secret machinations there loomed the silent and ominous shadow of the demon killed Jaden. In pursuit of furthering our magical resources, I opened a new school of magical discipline that became known as necromancy. We began training young warlocks in the arcane mysteries of life and death. Again, with tutelage from the demon killed Jaden, these necrolites delved into the dark arts, eventually gaining power enough to animate and control the bodies of the newly dead. Every victory, every success, left me with an emptiness I could not fill. I came to realize that the Shadow Council could serve my purposes only to an extent and thus I would require even greater power, should I wish to become the true harbinger of our destiny. There's the first picture of the demon killed Jaden. They've definitely, definitely changed that a lot. The mastery of forces, Medivh and Blackhand. Things were well within the Horde. Though the Shadow Council kept the warring clans pacified by the promise of escape from the dying world, I knew that this new order, much like the war against the Draenei, would provide only a brief respite if I could not find new lands for the orcs to conquer. My contemplation on this matter was disturbed late one night when I was surprised by the sound of screams emanating from the warlock's tower. I arrived to find many of the apprentices locked in deep trances, their faces twisted into masks of pain. The warlocks, whom I questioned in detail, could tell me only that they had felt an unexplainable presence in their dreams. I returned to my stronghold, deeply puzzled by the fact that whatever it was that had contacted the warlocks had made no attempt to reach me. I sought the counsel of Kill Jaden about this presence. He also was touched by this power a power that was beyond any he had ever experienced before. Whether it was the image of a force so awesome that it could cause this baneful demon to actually feel fear, or my own trepidation, I fled, moving aimlessly through the twisting nether to what seemed an eternity. It was during my fevered flight that the presence finally made contact with me. It radiated untold power, but it lacked the emotionless control displayed by Kilt Jaden. My senses seemed to take control over the dread that had engulfed me, and my mind began to cipher and reason. I knew that if I could divine the desires of this force, no matter how powerful I could use it to further my own ends, the presence identified itself as Medivh, a sorcerer from some far and distant world. We communicated not in words, but in a guarded joining of minds. His mind seemed boundless, but his thoughts moved so swiftly that it was difficult to learn anything from him. All the while I knew that he was probing me, learning more and more about the orcs and our magic. I could never learn as much from him as he would from me, and I soon broke contact with him. I sought the counsel of Kill Jaden, but he refused to answer my summons. That's also, there you go. Somehow I knew that he had forsaken his students because he was afraid of this Medivh. Ah, that part's, that's, that's changed. I found myself, again, doubting my skills. Could I contend with a being who could intimidate my own master? I continued to venture into the twisting nether for several weeks, all but forgetting the disturbance that had caused me to question myself. Then one night, Medivh appeared to me in my dreams. You fear me, you do not understand me. See my world and understand your fear, then fear no more. I was powerless to resist what came next. Barren wastes, dark swamps teeming with life, endless fields of emerald grasses, forests of magnificent trees, farmlands filled with rich harvests, villages of proud, strong people. Images came flashing much too quick to comprehend, and then something, a fleeting picture that left a long stirring inside of my soul. Buried deep beneath the ocean, dark and ruined, but still breathing, 
still pulsing with the lifeblood of the earth itself, an ancient power, ancient and terrible. I awoke. I embraced consciousness, knowing all along that the dream had been real. Medivh had shown me the wonders of his world, knowing that the Horde would not be content until his world was ours. I met with the members of the Shadow Council concerning the visions that we had seen. Although there was much debate as to the true intentions of this Medivh, I informed the Shadow Council that a way to escape from our world would soon be ours. I would seek the aid of Medivh in creating a way to get to his world, and then we would subjugate his race as we had done to all others who stood before us. Although he had appeared to many warlocks with these images of a new and fertile world, we agreed to keep the Shadow Council keep the knowledge of this enigmatic message to ourselves. Those warlocks outside of the Shadow Council, who had shared in the visions, were killed, for if the secret were revealed before preparations were made, the Horde would tear itself apart. Weeks passed with no word from Medivh. My attempts to contact him were fruitless. It was as if he had erased any trace of himself from the Twisting Nether. Some members of the Council gave up any hope of the wizard ever returning. Then the rift appeared. It took considerable time to expand the rift enough to send the massive frame of an orc through. The first scouts to return from the other side seemed to be driven completely mad by what they had seen. These early failures did not deter us, and subsequent quests confirmed that the world beyond this rift, oh, this is a long one, appeared similar to what was depicted in our visions. When the combined powers of the Horde's warlock clans and the Shadow Council, we were able to enlarge the mysterious rift so as to create a portal. This portal was used to move a number of orcs into this unknown land. A small outpost was quickly built on the other side of the rift, and the orc scouts were sent to explore the surrounding areas. The agents of the Shadow Council reported that the denizens of this world were called humans, and their lands were known as Azeroth. We found that these humans were a weak race, farming their fields and living peacefully in the countryside. I feared that they would prove no more of a challenge than the Draenei, and would not appease the hunger of the orcish war machine for long. The clan chieftains, quickly swayed by their lust for blood and war, agreed that it was time to leave this dying world and lay claim to the domains of Azeroth. While the Shadow Council kept close watch over the workings of the Horde, the masses looked to the clan chiefs as their leaders. Two chieftains arose, who were well respected and feared by the various clans, Chokgal, the ogre mage of the Twilight's Hammer Clan, and Kilrog Deadeye of the Bleeding Hollow Clan. These powerful leaders were expected to direct the Horde to a swift and savage victory over the humans. Thus, as the Horde gradually channeled through the rift into Azeroth, Chokgal and Kilrog began to plan their assaults against the human stronghold of Stormwind. The attack against Stormwind was catastrophic. Our armies, expecting to meet weak resistance, charged headlong into the enemy forces. Yeah, this is covered in the first manual. Surprisingly, the human soldiers held our forces at bay. Then they unleashed warriors mounted upon beasts of muscle and sinew to devastate our troops. The humans forced our troops to retreat back into the swamplands surrounding our outpost and the portal where only by the invoking by of the shrouding mists of shadow were we able to escape. This decisive and humiliating defeat threw the horde into chaos. Chokgal and Kilrog blamed each other's incompetence for the failure, and the orcs quickly polarized into factions that supported either chieftain. The Shadow Council desperately sought a remedy to the violence that was sure to follow, but the volatile nature of the orcs made it difficult to appeal to reason or wisdom. I realized that the horde needed a strong leader that could unify the clans under his control and be kept in his place, Thus did I first learn of Blackhand the Destroyer. Uh, yeah, that's definitely changed, because now Blackhand is not even unifying a horde until after they've attacked Stormwind. Blackwind, chieftain of the young Blackrock clan and a raider in the Sithgore arm, I don't think that survives, was well honored by most orcs within the horde. Most importantly, he was extremely lustful, and this made him easily corruptible. With help from the Shadow Council, I set the eager Blackhand upon the horned throne of the war chief. To his credit, Blackhand was a ruthless dictator who inspired awe and terror from his warriors. While the Horde rallied under Blackhand and the other chieftains acquiesced control to him, it was I who dictated policy by blackmailing and bribing Blackhand. With Blackhand's ascension to war chief, order was restored to the Horde. I was visited again by the visage of Medivh, who appeared more in control of his powers but less in control of his mind. Petitioning the Horde to destroy the kingdom of Azeroth, but to make him ruler of its people, Medivh offered all manners of treasures and baubles to me. I assured him that his world was ours for the taking, and that he held nothing that could persuade the Horde to do his bidding. His face broke into a wicked sneer as he proceeded to show me the image of an ancient tomb upon which was etched the name of the demon lord Sargeras. The tomb of Sargeras, the demon lord who had instructed my own tutor kill Jaden, was entombed upon this pathetic little world. Destiny had chosen to lay the hand upon my shoulders alone, for Kil'jaeden had told me that the lost tomb contained power absolute. 
enough to make any who could control it into a living god. But Eve pledged that he would grant me the location of the tomb if only I would use the horde to destroy his enemies. Thus the orcish hordes made war against the kingdom of Azeroth. The first war of orcish ascension. There's Orgrim Doomhammer presenting the head of Blackhand. Neat. We took the lands of Azeroth from the humans and raised all that we surveyed. My personal assassin, Garona the Half-Orc, executed Garona's leader, King Lane, and returned his heart to me. Okay, there you go. Although the Horde dominated Azeroth and the pathetic worms who defended it, my own plans were badly hampered. She didn't return the heart to him, though. A small band of human warriors stormed Medivh's towers and engaged the insane sorcerer in direct combat. As his body was slashed and torn by the swords of Azeroth, Medivh began to transmit telepathic waves of trauma across the astral plane, which easily shattered even my formidable defenses. I attempted to reach into the sorcerer's mind and steal the location of the tomb from him directly, but before I could divest the location, Medivh was killed by the Azerothians. Having been inside his mind at the moment of his temporal death, I suffered a massive psychic backlash and fell into a catatonic state. For weeks I slept as if dead, closely guarded by my faithful warlocks. When I finally arose, I learned of the shift in the balance of power within the Horde. Blackhand had been killed. Without my magics and counseling to aid him, Blackhand fell prey to a surprise attack launched by one of his strongest and most trusted generals, Orgrim Doomhammer. Orgrim was quick to consolidate his power within the Horde, justifying the assassination of Blackhand by securing false testimony that supported his claims of the Destroyer's incompetence as war chief. Whew. It seemed that the hand of fate had struck me a harsh blow. Orgrim set out to uncover the inner workings of the Horde, leaving no stone unturned. Eventually, his spies captured my servant Garona and, under intensive, agonizing torture, forced her to reveal the existence and location of the Shadow Council. She was weaker than I had expected. Suspecting that the Shadow Council was a threat to his control of the Horde, Doomhammer led his wolf riders in a surprise attack against my citadel near the ruins of Stormwind Keep. The warlocks, caught unprepared by Orgrim's assault, held off the Horde as long as their magics would last. Having no time to rest or replenish their energies, the warlocks fell before the wrath of Orgrim. In the end, Doomhammer was victorious. Any surviving warlocks were branded as traitors to the Horde. The public executions were effective in weakening my position and strengthening his. I was taken before Orgrim and questioned at length about my involvement with the Shadow Council, being greatly weakened by the backlash of Medivh's death as well as the energies I had expended during the battle. I found that I was in no position to either threaten or harm the war chief. Orgrim made it clear to me that the Horde was under his control and that he was not as easily swayed as his predecessor. The gleam in his eye and the steel at his side bespoke his intentions, but I would not be defeated so easily. While he may have held the upper hand, I reminded him that with the death of the Warlocks, I was the last true sorcerer within the Horde. And We just read that in the novel. Orgrim, made impudent by his victory, agreed that perhaps I could prove useful and agreed to let me live by his good graces. I silently vowed that he would one day take those words to his grave. Although his suspicions of me were never fully assuaged, I did succeed in convincing the war chief that the raiders were preparing to unite with the Sons of Blackhand in a revolt against him. Although this claim was untrue, Orgrim had already, was already suspicious of Rend and Mame, and so disbanded the multitude of wolf riders, sending them into the monstrous arms of the Grunt forces, and that explains why we don't have wolf riders in the second game. To demonstrate my loyalty to Orgrim and the Horde, I promised to create a host of undead riders that would be completely loyal to him, Although the Doomhammer did not fully trust me, the, the idea was sufficiently appealing, and so I was allowed to enter seclusion to create this new legion. And there's Gul'dan submitting to Doomhammer. Even with the aid of the Necrolites, I was unsuccessful in bringing forth this undead force. Failure and weakness were all that these minions could offer me, until I sensed that while their spirits were willing, it was the flesh that was weak. I summoned them to a great altar constructed of ironwood and black root, where at the height of a black incantation, I took the lives of every last one of them. In the bloody wake of their executions, the Necrolites would then at last nourish my creation of the ultimate undead servant. Using what few resources I still controlled within the Horde, I acquired many of the long-dead corpses of the fallen Knights of Azeroth. From these twisted and decayed forms, I instilled the essences of the greater members of the Shadow Council, who were quite willing to return to the mortal plane to wreak terror and havoc once again. I furnished each of the Dark Riders a jeweled truncheon through which they could better focus the unearthly powers they would brandish. Into these jewels were infused the raw necromantic magics of the freshly slain Necrolites. That's why we don't have those. Thus were the Death Knights born. Orgrim Doomhammer was pleased with these Knights of Death. Although the spirits of the Shadow Council remained loyal to me, they feigned allegiance to the War Chief. 
Orgrim was well satisfied with the realization of my promise and allowed me to go about my own affairs. I will be patient and bide my time, pretending to be the faithful servant until the time comes to show this presumptuous, boisterous upstart who is greater between us. My designs to discover the tomb of Sargeras still remain. I've assembled the Storm Reaver clan to be my support, and when the season finally comes to strike back at Orgrim for his insolent crimes against me, that day draws near, and Doomhammer cannot know what terrors await him, for I am Gul'dan, I am darkness incarnate, I will not be denied. You look at the undead eating that night. Okay, and I'm just going to look at the clans. We have the main clan, which is Blackrock, that is red, led by Orgrim. They stay in Blackrock Spire. We know about them. Stormweaver clan is blue, and that is Gul'dan's clan. Um, they stay in the conquered Stormwind and in Balor, which is the island off of it. Um, we have Twilight's Hammer clan, which is the purple clan. This is Chogall's clan. They stay in abandoned North Shire. There's the Black Tooth Grin clan that are black, led by Rend and Mame. They stay in the Black Morass, and those are probably going to be the Traitor clan. There's the Bleeding Hollow clan, which is green. Um, they are definitely allied, there, and they stay in Cosmodon and Ironforge, so we'll see them a lot there, led by Kilrog Deadeye. There's the Dragon Maul clan. They are white, led by Zulahed the Whacked. That's a funny name. And he, Zulahed, is the one that helps them. They stay in Grimbatol and Cosmodon. Um, they're definitely all about the dragons. And then there's the Burning Blade. They're not, oh, they're the chaotic, as Garona described them. They're not led by anyone. They are just, they're an orange clan. They're nomadic. Oh, and maybe they're the traitor clan because it says that They'll attack anyone, even their further orcs. So they might be the traitor clan. And Blacktooth, Grin, they may stay. But they're maybe they're they're black, so they're like Gil, Gilneas, where they're not really wanting to get involved. Peons instead of peasants. Hunt, Grunts are the footmen. Troll axe throwers are like the elves. The berserkers are their equivalent to the rangers. Ogres are knights. Ogre mages are their paladins. Catapults are from the last game. Death knights are the are the um com they are the ones that match up against the mages the sap goblin sappers love them um they're like the dwarven demolitionists the zeppelins from the goblins are like the orcish helicopters dragons compete with the griffins we got or oil tankers still troll destroyers instead of elven they have transports ogre juggernauts are like the battleships giant turtles are their versions of the submarines they're captured by the Storm Reaver clan, and they use spells to pacify them. Um, they just strap the goblins to control them, so goblins are behind the giant turtles. Look at that juggernaut. So the ogre mages can cast Eye of Kilrog. It's like, I like how they differentiated. You can't just see it with a little clearing of the fog of war anymore. It sends a little eyeball around that you have to search with. It's kind of neat. They have Bloodlust, which is like a battle buff. Runes, they're like traps you can place on the ground. They actually, you can use them to pretty good ex effect. Death Knights use Touch of Darkness. I think that's their main thing. They have Death Coil, Life Draining. Um, I don't know exactly how that works. Drains the Life Force. Oh, so it's like a uh, Drain Life. Haste, opposite of, that can be useful. Unholy Armor, it is OP. Just like it was in the last game. Death and Decay, that's like an AoE spell. It's their counter to the Ice Storm. Whirlwind. Oh, Death and Decay can, is what you use on buildings, whereas Whirlwind could hurt people, and they can raise dead to send skeletons out. They build pig farms this time instead of farms. Love it. Their Great Hall. Barracks, they have troll lumber mills instead of lumber mills. Same as Blacksmith, they get their watchtowers from before. I like how you're starting to get more iconic dwarf, uh, orcish architecture. They have shipyards, foundries, oil refineries. Um, they're, they upgrade to strongholds, ogre mounds instead of stables. Altar of Storms are where they get their ogre magi. Goblin alchemist, I love it. Um, Temple of the Damned for the Death Knights. Dragon Roost when you eventually get dragons and fortress very end. I like how it looks like Blackrock Spire. We've got our little maps here. And this is 
this last this last bit of the um, manual we will save for when we start the expansion because it tells what happens after the war. All right, that was a long one, possibly the longest episode we have ever done, but it is now in the pipes five by five. On the next one, we'll start this game. Thank you so much for listening. If if uh, you hung out and, and made it this long, you you're a real one. I'll see you on the next episode of Laura of Warcraft.